Good morning and welcome to Grand Rounds and welcome to everybody having survived the hurricane. So happy to have you. This morning we have with us Anne Mental Kerr. She's currently the project coordinator at the Children's Advocacy Center and is developing web-based training on a variety of child abuse issues, sexual abuse prevention, and human trafficking. She has 20 years of experience working with children in child abuse, human trafficking, working with DCF, and so forth. So this morning, we're very happy to welcome Ms. Kerr to talk to us about human trafficking. Please welcome Anne Mental Kerr. Thank you, thank you. Can you all hear me? Usually I don't even need a mic because my mouth is big enough, but thank you and I apologize for, for keeping you um, waiting. You all got your breakfast and your coffee, which is awesome, so I'm glad you're, you're set for that. So um, my name, of course, is Ann Pimentel Kerr, and I've worked with DCF for a very long time. I don't work for them anymore, but we work with them. I work for the Children's Advocacy Center now, which is a part of Orlando Health. So if you're not familiar with what we do, we do a See the Story tour over there, just like you guys do a See the Story of Sorts tour here as well. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail simply because I was delayed, so I want to get right into why I'm here. So human trafficking, of course, is a huge issue. I'm going to give you just a couple of definitions just so you know kind of why it's such a huge issue. Um, there's two different definitions up here. I'm just going to read the first one to you. It's a form of modern day slavery where people profit from the control and exploitation of others. I'm going to go into a couple of different things, just preliminary things for you. And then I'm going to go into a, a little bit of labor, but mostly sex trafficking. Um, because that's where I want to um, hone in on where you guys can do a lot of uh, insightful types of identification. So you're going to hear a lot of force, fraud, and coercion pieces of definition. And that is because with uh, people over the age of 18, force, fraud, and coercion is required per definition. Okay, So you have to have force, fraud, and coercion for it to meet the requirements to, uh, for it to be human trafficking. For youth, though, it doesn't have to have force, fraud, or coercion. It just has to have some um, level of um, exchange of something of value for it to be considered human trafficking. So there doesn't even need to be any force, any fraud, any coercion. If there's just something in exchange of value for you, that's all there needs to be. And I'll, I'll talk more about that. These are just some statistics just to show you how um, prevalent it is, how human trafficking is so prevalent. 20.9 million victims worldwide, 2.5 million victims <clears throat> in the U.S., up to 20,000 new victims brought to the U.S. each year, up to 80, 800,000 victims trafficked annually worldwide, 56% of victims are women and children, and 86% are used in the sex industry in the U.S. Is that such a big deal? Well, yeah. Because that is more revenue um, than Nike, Starbucks, and Google combined when we're talking about $35 million annually. Now, can we do without our Starbucks? No, a lot of us can't without our coffee. We can't do without. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. So unlike traffic, uh, traffic I'm sorry, unlike drugs and arms, it's, for example, who can do, let me go back, who can do without coffee? Who can do without those Starbucks type things? I know some of you don't drink coffee, I'm just going with me. Because I would have had my coffee with me had I not been running behind schedule. So what is something that you can't do without? For me it would be coffee in the morning or tea in the morning or whatever. What is something you can't do without? Young man right here. Oh, coffee. Coffee, okay, so you're with me, you feel my pain, okay, what else? Come on. Food, okay. Sleep. Sleep, okay. What about even cell phones? Okay, we all have cell phones, right? We're all, half of us probably looking at it right now while you're listening intently to what I'm saying, I know. Um, so even cell phones, iPhones are $800, $700. But we have iPhones, right? Or whatever phones you have, regardless, they're expensive. But the demand is there. If the demand wasn't there, they wouldn't be able to uh, sell them for so much money. We wouldn't be spending $3 for a cup of coffee, at minimum, 
right? <laughs> so the demand is there. So for, um, for the girls that are being sold, it's let me sell you a girl, but you're going to give her back and I'm going to sell her again. Versus a cup of coffee, you get to keep the coffee and it's done. Drugs, you get to keep the drugs and it's done. So it's over and over again. Guess what? Florida ranks in the top three in Florida for human trafficking. Um, cases of human trafficking have been reported in all 50 states. And again, back to supply and demand, high profit rate, um, low capture risk as well. Because the girls or the victims are the ones who are going to get in trouble. They're going to be the ones who are going to get arrested versus the pimp, the perpetrator, the trafficker, all one and the same. They're not going to be the ones who are going to get arrested for the most part. Okay, so there are two types of trafficking. For the most part, there's other types as well, but these are the two that we deal with for the most part. So labor and sex trafficking. Labor trafficking, you can go ahead and read that definition, but as you see, force, fraud, and coercion. That's required for anyone, again, over the age of 18. Is there labor trafficking for youth in Florida, do you think? Yeah, there is. There's labor trafficking for you. I don't go into too much detail because we only have a short amount of time, but the, the um, I call them the bin boys but the, and girls. But have you ever seen in public shopping centers or in Walmart shopping centers, and I see some heads nodding already, the traveling sales crews, those who are walking around with bins trying to sell stuff to you, those children are being trafficked. Those youth are being trafficked. Now. Is it in the traditional sense of construction workers or farm workers or those types? Not necessarily. They are being trafficked in the sense that the parents of these youth think that they're doing good, think that these children are making money. But they're not making money for themselves. They're making money for the dude in the van in the parking lot, pimping, literally pimping them out to get the money. If they want water, they have to pay for that water. If they uh, want lunch, they have to pay for that lunch. If they um, have to go, if they go to another county, which they do a lot, they, they literally, literally traveling sales crews they go around, they have to help pay for gas. So they might sell the guy three hundred dollars worth of merchandise, but go home with maybe twenty dollars. But the parents, they think it's a good thing, but it's not necessarily good. And these are all the places for. Um, <coughs> trafficking for labor that takes place. Now there's a lot of places right here in Florida that it happens. A lot of times people don't think that it does. But ladies and gentlemen too, how many of you get your nails done? And get your toes done, right? A lot of you do. So I'm not saying that all spas are people who are being trafficked. I'm not saying that at all. But let me give you an example. Um, I on occasion get my fingers and my toes done. Um, usually I try and have a conversation. Now, quite frankly, a lot of times I don't speak the language of the, uh, the ladies who do my nails. But sometimes they do, and they're very pleasant. Now, they're working on my toes, they're thinking, what's wrong with this lady's toes? I got jacked up toes. So what's wrong with this lady's feet, right? So when I'm doing that, and I'm trying to have a conversation, which I don't always do because I like, you know, to feel the, the massage of my feet, right? So. If I'm even having a conversation or having a question, but they don't answer and they don't look at me, and somebody out of nowhere is coming over and saying, is everything okay, is everything okay? That means they don't want my person to talk to me. Well, why not? What's the big deal? Because they don't want us to know what's going on in that store, okay? Typically. Now, honestly, in mine, they're all chit-chatting about all kinds of stuff. They're all having a good old time. They're probably talking about my feet. I, I don't know what they're talking about. But they're all usually having a good time. But if you're in a place where it seems a little shady, in that you're trying to have a conversation, and that person won't look at you and will not um, talk to you or have that conversation, and there's usually someone hovering because they don't want you talking, that might be just one indicator of um, potentially people being trafficked within that um, organization. And that's just an example. But there's uh, several other places as well. Um, and then hotels. And I don't mean um, that, for example, the Marriott is choosing to traffic people in the Marriott, whether it be in their, um, their, their maintenance department, whether it be in their 
um, um, laundry department or whatever the case might be, but what do they do? How do they get their staff? They subcontract out, right? So when they subcontract out, they don't know who then is being brought in. So that might be a situation. And I'll, I just say, said Marriott just because I know it's a, it's a big um, hotel chain. Could be a variety of others. I'm not singling out one. But that's sometimes how it occurs as well. <clears throat> this is just an example of where some of the traffic, um, where some of the, the organizations are. They could be right in our strip clubs. Strip, strip clubs. Well, they are in strip clubs. But they could be right in our strip malls. Um, so they could be anywhere that you might not even think. They could be right out here. They are right out here on OBT. Some of our young girls are right out here on OBT. Um, there's, there are times that I have left, uh, I'm over on Michigan and I've left work later than usual and I'll go home on OBT and get on 408. And I see girls who appear young that are looking like they're walking the streets. Well, and why aren't you doing something about it? Well, it's not like I can just go and pick them up, put them on my car and do something. It's not, it's not as easy as that I wish it was. But I, I can recognize that that's probably something that they're doing. I'll be walking the street and this is probably somewhere around. Um, which breaks my heart because they're not choosing to do that. So here are some examples of where it might happen. And it could, it's really just a matter of vulnerability. So it doesn't, it's not always where people from out of country are coming in, although that does happen a lot. It could be a simple situation where somebody has lost their job, happens a lot, um, after a hurricane. So let's say Irma, who has just devastated a lot of places, including local, right? So someone's lost their job, lost their house. So I guarantee you, pimps who are entrepreneurs, I'm telling you they are so smart. They're going to put up um, signs and billboards and, and advertisements that say, do you need to make money? You can make this amount of money if you do this. Just contact this number. So it's all false promises now. So remember the force, fraud, and coercion. So it's fraud. They're going to make these false promises, so you contact them. Yes, come on over for an interview and blah, blah, blah. And then it turns into a situation where it's payback, and then they have to do debt bondage and, and all of that. Um, so it's hope for a better life. Um, unstable home life, addictions. Um, oftentimes it's history of physical or sexual abuse, but it's attacking the vulnerabilities of people. And right now, and this is just the, an example of, of the hurricane, there's a vulnerability there of people who are going to be unemployed and have no housing. So people are going to be attacking that. And, and trust me, it's going to be out there. And it's a legitimate looking advertisement that people are going to be um, putting, putting out there on Craigslist, on, in the paper, on, on actual um, websites for um, looking for jobs. And so people are going to think they're legitimate. Unfortunately, they're not, and they will not know that until it's too late. Too late. So, what we call CSEC, Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children. And do you think any girl wakes up and says, hey, I want to walk the streets. That's my dream job. No. Most want to be something like a doctor, like a nurse, social worker, um, a dancer. Usually not a strip dancer. Usually it's a dancer. Um, most of them want to be something that is good, does good for someone. It doesn't work this way. Oh, yeah, let's be a teacher, but you know, I think I'll change my profession to go be a stripper or to go walk the streets. Um, <clears throat> C-sex survivor, it's not a choice. No one wakes up to and wants to do this, but you can't just walk away. And that's a difficult concept for people to grasp, even for me, honestly, and I'm in the business. Why can't you just walk away? You know you don't want to do this. You know it's something that's not good for you. Walk away. It's like telling a domestic violence survivor victim, just walk away. He's hitting you. He's beating you. Just walk away. It's not as easy as that. So it's a similar concept as that. CSEC is a sexual activity involving a child in exchange for something of value, which remember I said a minute ago. Um, uh, the, for the promise of, um, for example, money, clothing, shelter, etc. I'll give you some examples. Try to, child is treated as commercial sexual object, and it's, of course, a form of violence against children. 
And there is not required if a child is under the age of 18 to be forced fraud or coercion. So I want to stress that if you ever come into contact with children, anyone under the age of 18 in the hospital setting who, um, you're, if you're trying to determine, well, is it forced, is it fraud, or is there, is there coercion? It doesn't have to be. Those elements do not have to be there. Just the mere fact that there's trafficking, and there's sex trafficking, it's, it's, it's against the law. Children do not have the capacity to consent to that, okay? So it doesn't require those, um, those elements. So just as an FYI, in May of 2009, DCF added the maltreatment of, of human trafficking to their maltreatment index. They didn't have it prior to that. Um, so they recognized that there was a need for um, this to be a maltreatment. So there's 25 different maltreatments with DCF. So this was added in 2009. So it has grown, when I say grown, the, the number of um, cases that have been called in, pretty much 100% every year since. So that's how, how much awareness is out there and how um, people are calling in cases of human trafficking. It doesn't always come in that way though. It might come in as um, sexual abuse and then the investigator realizes it's really a case of human trafficking. It might come in as a situation of physical abuse, realizing that it's sexual abuse and there's human trafficking. So it can be added to a bunch of different ones, but it's a relatively newer maltreatment. Just a reminder, of course, that everyone in the state of Florida is a uh, professionally mandated reporter um, that must leave their name, which is you guys, um, in your capacity. Um, everyone, of course, in this room would be considered that. So the Department of Justice estimates that the most frequent age of entry in the commercial sex industry is ages 12 to 14 years old. How many of you have children within that age range? Nieces, nephews, grandchildren, kids that you know between 12 and 14. That's a little frightening, don't you think? That is a little frightening. So within 24 hours of a child running away, a young person is likely to be solicited for prostitution or another form of commercial sexual exploitation. So what that means is if a child, um, and, and remember vulnerabilities, and I'll talk about that in a second, but any child who has a vulnerability, let's say they run away, even if they run away for a day, they ticked off at mom, dad, whoever their guardian is, they run away for a day, they go to their friend's house or whatever, but somebody sees them in the street looking a little down, that's a perfect opportunity. Perfect opportunity to roll up in that Cadillac and hey baby, you look a little blue. That, they're just attacking, they know, they know. It's amazing to me how they know. They're attacking that vulnerability, sweet talk them, sweet talk them, sweet talk them. And out of the 10 that they might try and sweet talk, they might get 50% of those kids to come in their car and then they're gone with those kids. Hopefully, with more education, kids will be able to recognize that they're being sweet talked and will not get in that car. But until we get the word out more, we're losing kids to these sweet talkers. So, of course, I talked just a second ago about the vulnerabilities. Now, it could be any type of vulnerability. These are the typical ones. Any child who um, has, has a history of any type of abuse, there's a vulnerability there. And these are typical vulnerabilities of, that could be with any child. But every child, and quite frankly, every adult, at any given moment could have a vulnerability. If you remember back to your youth, if you ever broke up with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, at that moment, there's a vulnerability. You are feeling like crap. You are feeling like, this is the worst day of my life. I'm 13 years old and I've lost the love of my life, right? The love of my life has gone and left me for another 13 year old. My heart is broken. I'm vulnerable, right? I'm vulnerable because my life is over at 13. You, you know, you don't know what you're doing, right? So, um, or I'm in love with, you know, a senior in high school. Let's say I'm just looking at you because you're so cute. So I'm in love with a senior in high school, and you're very pleasant to me. You're very nice to me. You're, you're, that's just you because you're a nice guy. But then you're da you start dating her in high school. This is the other senior in high school, and they're the prom king and queen, and I'm in ninth grade. 
I'm devastated because I thought you liked me just because you were nice to me. I mean, you weren't coming on to me or anything. You were just a nice guy. Oh, I thought you liked me. Oh, my life is over. But that, you know, teenagers think that way. That's just the, the life of a teenager, right? It's not like you did anything wrong, but my life is over. Someone else, someone with bad intentions might take advantage of that. It could be just something as um, uh, easy, or when I say easy, I don't mean it in, in a cavalier kind of a sense, but, and, and I'll go to the gentleman in the room. Have you ever tried out for a team and either had a bad game or didn't make the team or got yelled at by your coach or something like that? Put you in a crappy mood, right? That makes you vulnerable at the moment because boys are victims too of human trafficking. It is mostly girls. We know that, but I don't want to rule out that guys and, and boys, young men, are also victims. So any vulnerability could be a weight issue. Um, young girls, how many, we all know that. Any, any, everyone wants to look like who? Taylor Swift, Beyonce, or whoever the, the latest is on social media. If you don't get 7,000 likes in a minute, your life is over when you're nine years old and you have an iPhone, right? So. So, uh, social media does create different types of vulnerabilities in children, so we also need to be aware of that as well. So vulnerabilities could be anything, not just these types of things. So I just want to throw that out there. And sex trafficking, sex trafficking can happen anywhere. So residential brothels, do you think that that actually happens here? It does. It, years ago, I'm like, that doesn't happen here. It, it's in apartment complexes. It's a residential brothel. There's a residential apartment brothel. So there are some houses in certain um, uh, housing complexes that are brothels, okay, in the traditional sense. Now, is it known that it's a brothel? No. But is it a brothel? Yes, because it, that's where girls are being trafficked in and out. Just be aware of that when you see cars going in and out of that house. Does it mean it's a brothel? No. Does it mean that it's uh, uh, drugs in and out? Maybe. Could it mean that there's girls in and out? Maybe. Just keep your eyes open because you never know. You never know what that neighbor of yours is doing. Um, of course, massage parlors, some of these are pretty obvious. Truck stops. There's a lot of trafficking that goes on in truck stops, but there is um, uh, truckers against trafficking. It's awesome. If I had time, I'd show you a video. You can look it up. Truck, uh, Google truck, Truckers Against Trafficking. They're a big organization now. They're like, they're not about this trafficking against young women. Some of them don't want to belong to that because they're the ones who want the young girls while they're at the truck stops. But it's TAT, T -A -T, <clears throat> Truckers Against Trafficking, great organization of men who are like, oh no, this is not happening on my watch. So Google it when you get a chance, and it's an actual organization, so good for them. Um, of course, street prostitution, fake businesses, etc. Escort services. So recruitment, and remember, I'm talking specifically for young girls. Recruitment can be anywhere. Recruitment can be right here in your hospital when the pimp, the John, the um, the entrepreneur are waiting for their girls to come out of the ER. And I'll talk about that in a second, but it can be here. But all of these places, coffee shops, group homes, gas stations, it really can be anywhere. Um, even in the courthouse down off of Michigan, um, there's guys waiting out there when girls get out of the court. And of course, that's a vulnerability because their parents are ticked off at them. Their parents might not want anything to do with them. And there's a, a group home uh, right there. There's a shelter there. Um, come on with me. I'll take care of you. I've got a bed. I've got money. I'll take care of you. And sometimes the girls and the boys uh, are taken advantage of that way as well. The malls and the parks, and this is not just this is not to um, make anyone fearful. <laughs> I do this with teachers and and other um, social service agencies, and I talk about malls. I'm never letting my kid go to the mall again. Okay, just be aware that it does happen in the mall. It happens a lot in the malls. Um, so be yes, be be aware, be. Fearful if you let your child go alone to the mall, even if it's a 15-year-old young girl. In that, you need to make your child aware of what's happening. Because these people who want to make your child a mom, 
that's, it's, it's unrealistic that they're just going to walk up to your child with a card and say, hey, you're handsome. Let me make you a model. Or, hey, beautiful. Let me make you a model. You look really good in, in a bathing suit, especially with your pregnant belly. You look really, really good. But you never know because mom and dad might not be real happy with you right now. And you might take up, take up on that. You never know. So, so where, where are advertisements happening for the young girls? They're happening everywhere. And, and uh, social media? I'm not a, I, old people, I, I'm old. Facebook apparently is for old people, is what I'm told by my young children. My young, well they're not young, but by my children. Facebook, ah, oh, Facebook's for old people. But Facebook can be used, but Instagram, Snapchat, Kick, Craigslist is an older version of Backpage. Now Backpage has been in a lot of trouble lately, but that hasn't stopped them. Um, um, young people, tell me some more. What are some other ones? Ooh, are we all old? I know we're not all old in here. Come on now. So there's a ton of them. You get my point about social media? You can recruit people right through social media. Same thing with gaming. Are anyone, any gamers in here? It's okay. It's not a bad thing. Don't get in trouble. I'm going to call you out. Okay, so game. I'm not a gamer. I don't know how it works. But my understanding of gaming, if you're a big gamer, you can put a headset on and you can game with people in other countries, right? So. And which is fine, you can do that, and it's most of the time it's great. But I will tell you, my uh, my girlfriend, when my girlfriend's son was 12 years old, he's a big gamer, and he was on this team, and in other states, and I don't know how it works. But she said that he was contacted by another 12 year old, in a gaming device, for him to um, be on the team, and it was another state, and that they would pay for him to come to this other state to be on their team to compete in this tournament. Well, what 12-year-old has that? What? So she's like, all right, they can pay for me too. We're, we're there. And of course, she never, they never heard from them again. But that, that's a direct recruitment tactic. And there are some parents who might be like, what a great opportunity. I would never be able to afford to send you to anything like this. Let's get it set up out of ignorance. And, and I mean, I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory way. I just mean that they don't know any different. So they might set it up so that they send the child and they would send the child to harm's way. None of us would probably do that, but you never know. So it's, it's easy for gamers to, to come in through the system. There was another scenario when this was, I heard this at a conference. There was another, was it a conference? I heard it somewhere. Conference where a father um, had come home and he knew that the son was a big gamer. And excuse my expression, but we're all medical people here. So he came in, found his son masturbating to an adult male in the um, um, in the game forum, but he was on the TV. An adult male and a child masturbating to each other through this gaming device. And the father was like, what? <laughs> of course, what the hell is going on? And the, the kid was like, well, we do this all the time. This is what he wants me to do. And I get these Bitcoins. I don't know what Bitcoins are, but I guess Bitcoins is to help the game improve and to go to different levels. So it's just another way to get kids to do something different. And for this kid, it was like, all right, I'll do that. I'm not hurting anybody. He's by himself. No one's hurting him. But it was just another level of being exploited. So it, it, it's a terrible thing. Um, okay, so these are just some areas that advertisements and recruitment um, arenas happen. Um, Backpage, are you familiar with Backpage? Backpage, um, the CEOs of Backpage recently have gotten into a lot of trouble. I'm not sure the status of it now. But they have made millions and billions of dollars knowing that girls are being advertised on Backpage um, and, and allowing it to happen, young girls. Because I guess you can do it over 18, but they know that girls under the age of 18 have been advertised, even though the actual age is saying over the age of 18. But they know, and they're allowing it to happen because they're making so much money. Um, but they've recently been busted and, and gotten in trouble, but I'm not sure what the status of it is now. Craigslist has taken it down. They've taken down that particular type of um, advertisement for young girls.
So here's some examples of sex trafficking for minors. So, and people don't always think this as being trafficking. So Julie, who's 13, is agreeing to oral sex in exchange for a place to sleep. So Julie, who might be vulnerable, has nowhere to go. She needs a place to sleep. So all right, I'll perform oral sex. Um, a father is trading Trisha 15 for crack. Does that surprise anyone that that's actually considered trafficking? A mother allowing her landlord to have sex with her daughter, who is 12, as rent payment. 16-year-old Joey trading a sex act for food. A nightclub owner providing shelter or food in exchange for exotic dancing. These are just some very minor examples of what trafficking could be. So in Osceola County, because um, we, serve, we service Osceola County as well, our advocacy center does, there's a lot of um, this type of activity going on in Osceola County. Because, and in Orange as well, but I say most, uh, more Osceola because there's a lot of hoteling, meaning there's a lot of homeless um, families who live in hotels. So what do they do? Hey, do you want to take care of my kid for me? Yeah, I will if. Or I don't have anywhere to stay. All right, let's all bunk in here and you can stay here if I have access to your kid. So there's a lot of that type of activity going on. Um, more in Osceola, but trust me, it happens everywhere. And these are just some examples of the violence of uh, CSEC, okay? And the reason, and I've got several of these examples here for you, because these are examples that you will see in the hospital. So here I have, I know I've got doctors, I've got nurses. Who else do I have in this room? Medical students. Thank you, who else? Doctors, nurses, medical students. Anyone else? Okay, all right, fine. Um, and you will see these examples here, I hope, if they come to the hospital for care. So 14-year-old, she's gang raped by 15 men, and she's injured, and they bring her, because they might not bring her to, to get medical care. 17-year-old um, witnessed her uh, pimp murdering another girl. She's too scared um, to ever tell the police about the crime. 11-year-old, uh, her pimp whips her entire back with a belt buckle. The beating leaves permanent scars. She may come here for treatment. Uh, Terry, who's 13, she's arrested and raped by a police officer. I know that gives a bad reputation to police officers. There's some great ones out there, but there's not some great ones out there. Danielle's 13, when she's gang raped by 10 men, who then leave her bleeding in, a, in, in an abandoned car. You might see something like that. Chanel is 16 when her body is found wrapped in a trash bag. She's strangled, her, her murder was never served by the soul. Sherelle is 17 when she's beaten with a two by four, the wood of which is hammered with nails and her head requires 34 stitches. So you would see that because that's how she would get the stitches. So how would you go about even finding out what happened? She's not gonna come out and say, hey, by the way, I was beaten with uh, a two by four by my pimp. That's not going to happen. It's just a conversation of how do you get information. Um, Janelle is held down by gunpoint, weapon aimed between her legs while her pimp parks her name into her thigh with, with a box cutter. So if you ever see some name inside her thigh or any type of injury inside her thigh with a box cutter, how do you even ask those types of questions about what it is? Or would you ask those questions when she didn't come in with that injury in the first place, when she came in for perhaps for something else? Ashley, who's 17, she's gang raped by five men, stabbed in her vagina, and left in the street to die. Hopefully someone found her and you would see something like that. Annabelle's 14, when the John stabs her repeatedly, she needs more than 100 stitches. Uh, Renee is 17, when her pimp bends together a wire, wire hangers for a pimp stick, um, and he used that to beat her. She can't sit down for a week, and I'll show you a picture of actually a pimp stick beating. Kimberly is 15 when a John holds her at gunpoint and beats her for hours. Toya is 14 when her pimp beats her and cuts off her hair as punishment. These are just some examples of the violence of CSEC. So sometimes girls um, initially glamorize the, the life of prostitution. So when we see girls um, who are in the life, and I'll show you some of the terminology, the life, um, oftentimes society says, well, they're choosing that, or 
That's the life they chose. They deserve that. Look at what she's wearing. She deserves that. There is no choice in that life. They might have made the choice to go with that man who claims to be their boyfriend, but they're going under the guise of a different lifestyle. They're going under his um, trickery, under his manipulation. That's, they didn't choose the lifestyle of being put out into the street. They're going hoping for a better life and to be loved. That's what they're searching for, not the other. Okay, so if we can help change the societal mind frame into looking at it differently, we're going to help the um, the girls in how we look at um, how we look at them. Same thing with law enforcement; they've gone through extensive training, and they don't they don't arrest them for for being prostitutes anymore. They'll take them off the street. They might have an arrest to get them off the street to get them to safety, but the the charge is not going to stay. Okay, does that make sense? Um, okay, so the pimp stick. I'm going to show you a, a photo of what a beating could be. And you may or may not see this. They might come in for treatment or they might not. But this girl would be required to continue to perform her duties. She would continue, uh, need to continue to have sex with her quota, whatever that is, and it could be up to 10, 20 men to bring in that quota number, that dollar number. Doesn't matter if she can't sit, doesn't matter if it hurts like crap. It just matters that she brings in the money. But this is an example of a beating. And trust me, all the other girls that are in this stable, which is what the house is called, are gonna witness this because that's gonna keep them in line as well, okay? Okay, so who might recognize the victims within the hospital setting? So clearly all of you, but I also want to make sure that it's clear that everybody within the hospital system could, in fact, see these victims. So, and I don't have everybody up here. Last night I was thinking, who else, who else, who else? I ju I've just got up here the ones who came to my head initially. But when I put up their valet services, they're the first people who might actually see so if I've got, um, let me just use you as an example. So what is your name? Gene. Gene. So if I've got Gene rolling up in his car, Gene, and I'm just picking on you because you were there. So Gene's rolling up in his car, and most pimps, entrepreneurs have decent looking cars. So valet services might, in fact, recognize or hey, that's a pretty decent car in their head. They're not gonna, you know, maybe have a conversation with you about it because they're they're busy. But they might be the first ones to recognize that car, and they might be the first ones to recognize the interaction between Jean and the girl, if in fact Jean is the one bringing the girl to the, to the hospital. It might not be Jean. It might be one of the other girls in this stable, okay? But if it is in fact Jean, then the ballet guys or girls, they're the ones who, they might be like, well, this is, this is odd. They might need to then go talk to triage or the admissions folks or the ER. I'm not sure the line of command or however it works here, but they might be the one to say, keep an eye, watch it or something. Okay, so, so Jean, it, it might be a red flag with Jean. Okay, just a little red flag. Or Jean might be like kicking her out the door and just say, call me when you're done and she might roll up. That should be a red flag to somebody. If he's kicking out a young girl, a minor, that should be a red flag to somebody. None of you would know that that happened, except the valet guy, okay? So would it hurt to get the valet guys drink? Wouldn't hurt, right? So, and again, all of these other folks as well. Same thing with, uh, with billing. Uh, and I don't know if I'm calling the right terminology, but you know what I mean, the billing. You know, because they go around, right? They need to make sure, how are we gonna get paid for this? So if it is Jean, who, trust me, the girl is not going to say Jean is my pimp. She's going to say Jean is my boyfriend, Jean is my uncle, Jean is my brother. She's going to say everything but what Jean truly is. So she might say, yeah, you're going to have to talk to, to my brother, for example. So Jean might like, yeah, I'm, I'm paying cash. Okay, that's a little odd. If I'm correct, am I correct? Do you think that's a little odd? Okay, so yes, thank you. <laughs> so it's a little odd to pay cash for an ER service. Um, there's no insurance. Now I know not everybody has insurance and I get that, 
but to pay cash is a little odd. And Gene could care less, and his affect is telling us that. But who knows that? The billing people, the person who's asking these questions about payment. Gene's indifferent. He could care less. He's just worried about when she can get back out so she can go back out on the street. Well, the only one who's going to have that information is the billing person. And maybe the valet person might have put thrown out that caution to the billing person or somebody. So now there's a couple extra people who have their eyes on this girl. Um, so um, how they're paying for it, um, is there insurance, is there not insurance? Um, same thing with housekeeping and even in the cafeteria. Cafeteria, they might hear Jean on the phone talking to some of the other girls, saying, she's going to be out for a couple of weeks, we need to get some more girls. Those are cautionary statements. Okay, cautionary statements, and people, Gene might be like, no one knows what I'm talking about, and he might be loud enough and arrogant enough thinking, what are they going to do to me? I've done nothing wrong. So it wouldn't hurt to get more information out there to everybody within the system. Um, same thing with maintenance and lab techs. So if a lab techs, and again, I don't know if I'm calling people the right people, but if, if the girl has to go for a specific um, test, she might say something indifferent to a lab tech versus a doctor versus a nurse because you guys might be a little bit more intimidating to her than someone else, okay? Um, okay, so this is just a, a sample statement. During the time that I was on the street, I went to hospitals, urgent care clinics, women's health clinics, and private doctors. No one ever asked me anything anytime I ever went to a clinic. I was on birth control during the 10 years I was on the streets, mostly depo Prevera shots, which I got at Planned Parenthood and other neighborhood clinics. I also got the morning after pill from them. I was young, and so I had to have a waiver signed in order to get these. One of the doctors, a private doctor, I think, signed this waiver when my uncle took me to see him. This is a survivor um, by the name of Lauren. So no one within the hospital system recognized that there was a red flag at all. Um, okay, so pass some, some additional possible indicators in a medical setting. And I, I put up they're not in school. Well, how, do you care if they're not in school? In conversation, because you guys are going to talk to these kids. Nurses, doctors, medical students, residents. You guys are going to have conversations. That's what you do. You have conversations. Hey, what school do you go to? I don't go to school anymore. I dropped out. And the child's 14 years old. Well, you can't really drop out at 14. So that might be a red flag. And I'm not asking you to do in-depth uh, interviews or anything like that. It's just conversation so that if you, ever, if you have red flags, you have information that you can then either report or get social, um, your social work department involved. And I highly recommend you to do that. Um, avoiding contact, resisting being touched, of course, drugs and alcohol use, um, any of these as well. Evidence of any injuries. So if they're coming in for, um, and I think I have all of the STDs and all that, maybe that's on the next slide. Um, STD, but uh, they're, they have evidence of other injuries because they'll, they'll get a beat down, they'll get um, other injuries from their pants or from the other girls if they're out of line. So ask, you can ask questions, I presume, about wait, what happened there? How did that happen? And if there's no clear history, I don't know what happened. It was no big deal. And they're blowing it off. That could be a concern as well. Um, coach cover story, it seems like a standard canned cover story. Just be aware of that. If they're unable to give addresses or IDs or they say that they're here from, um, from out of state, girls are trafficked um, from state to state. So they might be here from Michigan. They might be here from another state, from California. Well, what are you doing here? I'm here with my uncle. Uncle Jean. So I'm here with my uncle. Um, well, how long have you been here? Oh, just a couple months. Oh, where's mom and dad? Oh, they're back in California. These, some of these things don't add up. Some of these things should not make sense to you, okay? Um, uh, they don't appear the stated age because they are coached well to say that they are older than they are. They're very, coached very well to say that. Um, uh, if they're with an older companion, and this is a big one, so and that's where triage might come in more than you because you might not see them back in the room. So if, if they're with an older companion, because really, what 15-year-old 
would be hanging out with a 30, 35 year old. Or let me reverse that. What 30, 35 year old has any good intention with a 15, 16 year old? None, right? And if you say any, I'd be concerned. So there really is no good intention, unless it's a true Uncle Gene, unless it's truly Uncle Gene or true big brother, but they're usually, they're usually not. Um, so if there's persistent STDs, UTIs, pregnancies, um, uh, abortions, miscarriages, and, and tampons or cotton debris in the vagina, now, whoa, what's that mean? Well, that is to stop, if they're on their menstrual cycle, it's to, to stop the bleeding so that they continue, excuse me, I know, look at your face, I know, <laughs> to continue for them to perform their duties, to continue to make money so that the Johns, the buyers, don't know that they're on the period. So, I know, it's kind of, it's like, really, why? Well, because they need to continue to make their money. But what happens sometimes is the tampon or the, um, the cotton, whatever, might get um, impacted. Is that the right word? I'm not a doctor, but you know what I'm saying. So it might get whatever where they have to come to, to you to get removed. Well, the question would be, well, how did this happen? Well, does it make sense what they're telling you? Okay. Um, of course, any vaginal or anal trauma, complications from attempted abortions, because there might be home abortions. There might be attempted um, back street type uh, of abortions. Now, I'm sure you guys get weird things all the time. You see these types of things on Facebook. You see these types of things on the news that are, you know, the weirdest things that people got stuck in cavities of their body. You know, you see these stupid things on, on, the, on news all the time. But when we're talking with, with youth, these are um, things that could be considered a trafficking situation. And trust me, they're not going to tell you I'm being trafficked. That's not the word. So I caution you to use the terminology of trafficking. Are you being trafficked? They will never admit to that. It's just a matter of you gathering some information. So tattoos and branding is a huge um, indicator of you being, being trafficked. So if, in fact, you see, uh, excuse me, odd tattoos. I'm not talking Tweety Bird. I'm not talking flowers. I'm not talking what's another typical one of, of a youth. Um, I'm not talking that. I'm not talking, you know, football type things for boys and that type of thing. I'm talking ones with dollar signs with, uh, see that one uh, over here, it says successful on it. That's This is an actual DCF girl. She's aged out of the system and she's she was still in the life up until, as far as I know, she's still in the life. And she is the administrative assistant to the pin. And her, they call them the bottom, the bottom bitch is what their title is, which is actually the administrative assistant to, I know, it makes no sense. Their hierarchy needs a little adjustment, but um, that she was the administrative assistant their title is bottom bitch. So these are ter terminology that if you ever hear that, I'm the bottom. Well, what are you, the bottom? That's the terminology. She is like the admin. Um, so these are actual um, types of tattoos that you might see in odd places. Across the chest, who does that? Um, uh, on the neck, who does that? There are certain um, tattoos that are on their face. Girls don't do that. Girls will not do that of their own accord um, unless they are forced to do so. OK, so I know I'm running behind. I want to give you an actual. OK, so here's some terminology. Um, daddy is usually the name of the pimp. If you hear a girl refer to him as daddy, that is the name of her pimp. Um, the game, that is the, the, the life, the game. Um, the bottom is the bottom bitch. Wifey is the names of the other girls that, that she works with. So it's um, uh, my wifey or my wife-in-law. The stable is the girls within the household. Um, uh, lot lizard is within the, the truck stops. That's where the, that's where the girl, that's what they're referred to as lot lizards. Uh, this girl, Sarah, doctors knew I was having sex with older men and had beat up multiple times but didn't put it together that I was a trafficking victim. 
Okay, so I'll end with this uh, story. This, this is a real story. Um, this man promised to make a girl a star, instead turned her into a prostitute. And this was back before um, 2009, before DCF had, had the maltreatment. So Dwayne Lawson befriended a 17-year-old Central Florida girl on MySpace. This was back when MySpace was a big deal. Um, he promised to make her a star. Instead, he made her a prostitute. He pimped her out on the street thousands of miles from home, sold her um, services on Craigslist according to her old complaint. Now, in addition to that, on that story, she ended up in the ER. In the ER, she had um, multiple STDs. So she couldn't, once you have STDs, she was given medication. She was told that she could not have sex for two weeks until she was clean, she was cured. She, um, the, it was a nurse who told her that she couldn't have sex for two weeks. She curled up in a position and started to shake and told the nurse, can you please tell my brother, Gene, can you please tell my brother, Gene, that I can't have sex for two weeks? What the hell does her brother care if she can't have sex for two weeks? That nurse knew enough at the time, and remember this was years ago, to recognize that that was a red flag. So they actually arrested, Jean, they arrested Dwayne Lawson um, because this was a missing child. They knew that this was a missing child and they were able to piece all the pieces together to figure out that this was a missing child. The pimp was in the waiting room and they were able to arrest him right from the waiting room because the nurse recognized that what was said didn't make any sense. So, so if you're able to have any of those conversations with the child and gather some information, that would be awesome. Yes, ma'am. This is terrific information, and I think that we've become more aware of it, seeing that we're we'll being able to recognize it, especially in the pediatric setting. So this is terrific. The challenge has become when they're above the age of 18. Yes. I mean, that is, I, so a friend who's a needy dog within our system, the child, she was 19, mm -hmm. and knew I had an interest. So, they picked up on it. And she was all the things you said, but 19 with an older man, dirty, you know, she looked dirty, you know, infected, and she looked horrific. Yeah. So they all picked it up. The ED picked up on it. What do you do? And she doesn't say anything. So yeah. then they were trying to help her. So he texted me, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna cover her house, but she has to make a complaint. I call the one hand trafficking number from her. They're like, a friend of mine who's really involved in this was like at the media, they're like, don't do that. Get, can you have the police come? There has to be, I said, where's your social worker? They kept trying to talk to her, and he, so many signs were there. He kept her ID in his car, so to get the ID at least. So they were able to get the ID, and kind of, he started to get belligerent. Like, yeah. why can't I get in the room? They kept them separate. Then they were at least able to call the police because he was belligerent, and that scared him enough to get him away from her so that you know, her mom was out of state. So then people just checked in and got our own plate, to be honest, because what else can we do to get out of state that night? Right. And to at least give word later that she was safe. Right. But she wouldn't admit to any, but all the signs were there. Right? Yeah. All, and so then, then I was, my eyes opened up to the challenges when you're above the age of 18. Yeah, and that is a challenge over the age of 18 and under. They, they, they will not, um, admit to being a victim. And it's because they are so frightened of what's going to happen. So it's a matter of if they choose to go back, that's their choice. But ensuring that they know that they can always come back to you. But we empower our social workers are fantastic. Yes, yes. And that's the key. Yeah, they're fantastic. But what can you do when they're... You, the there's nothing. nothing. There's nothing. And I know what we want to do in this field is to rescue everybody, and we can't do that. So remember, remember, I, I use the analogy of a domestic violence victim. They're going to go back the average number seven times before they're going to actually leave. It's a similar concept here. So it's a matter of knowing when you're ready to go, you can come here. Victim Service Center, they work a lot with over the age of 18, and they are good about that as well. But there's nothing you can do, and you cannot restrain. It's just letting them know that there's a place to go when they're ready. Unfortunately, it's not what we want to hear because we want to fix it now, but we can't always do that. So what you did was absolutely perfect.
I know that's not what you want to hear. I know, I know. I called all the numbers and it was horrible. I know. Like, I was, I was on waiting on the phone. <laughs> yeah. So I wasn't there, but I was helping him from a distance. Like, one 800 abolitionists, like everything. Yes. It was really torture. It, can, it was time sensitive. Yes, absolutely. It's time sensitive. And I have a couple of, um, I know for those of you who have to go, but I have the numbers here, but you already have them, obviously. Um, so if you want to take a photo of this line, and I can also send it to whoever needs the numbers. Um, but it is very, very difficult. And there was one, there's several different things that I've read of, of, of victims. When they have been to hospitals, they said the best thing that ever happened to them in a hospital was that a social worker or a nurse simply <coughs> hugged them. And they said that they haven't been hugged in, a, in that capacity in so long, it felt so good. So if you ever know that something's happening and that's something that they're open to, it's just a hug. And that sounds so cheesy, but for that girl, those girls that have read, that, that's that helped. That's how yeah. able to get yeah. there. Yeah. Um, so I've got that page and I've also got that one. So there's two different numbers. So the, the human trafficking hotline and of course our 800 number. Um, but then there's, there's Polaris Project, and then there's um, the one you just said, um, Abolitionist. Florida Abolitionist, which is local. Um, there's Victim Services Center. So, but if you, if you go to our, our hotline, our DCF hotline, and it's, it's, a, it's not an appropriate call for them, they will route you to the appropriate call, the appropriate number. So I know it's a very difficult situation, especially when 18, just because you're 19, I mean, you're not a kid. You're still a kid. You just happen to be of the age of majority. So um, yeah, very difficult, but thank you for sharing that. So. Um, thank you guys. If you have questions, I'm, I'm willing to stay, but if you have, if you have questions, but I appreciate